Blickling Hall. Elsham Norfolk. The winding lane takes you from Elsham, and once you are past the church, suddenly, without warning, across an expanse of lawn bordered by dark yew hedges, the pinnacled rose red Blickling Hall comes into view. Romantic, symmetrical, and laden with history and legend. Here, guarded by stone bowls, we enter the house that probably harbors the ghost of Anne Boleyn. Although there does not appear to be any authentic evidence that she was ever at Blickling, perhaps she lived here for a time in an earlier house as a little girl. This must at least be likely. What is certain is that the manor of Blickling is recorded in Doomsday Book as having belonged to Harold, King of England, and to William the Conqueror. Later, another warrior, Sir Thomas Erpingham, veteran hero of Agincourt, held Blickling and indeed sold it to the rich knight Sir John Fastolf, the Falstaff immortalized by Shakespeare. Later, still, this lovely place saw King Charles II and Queen Catherine when the king knighted the son of Sir John Hobart. And here, Henry VIII may have courted Anne Boleyn. So a local poet penned the lines, Blickling, two monarchs and two queens is seen. One king fetched thence, another brought a queen. Another owner, John, 2nd Earl of Buckingham, died an unusual death. According to Horace Walpole, he suffered from gout in his foot, dipped it in cold water, and so killed himself. About a century earlier, the owner was Sir Henry Hobart, the 4th Baronet. And he met his death in a duel on the 21st of August, 1698, on Colston Heath. Unlucky Sir Henry had chosen a left-handed man to fight, Oliver Lenev, and he quickly ran Sir Henry through the body. At nearby Colston, at the crossroads, stands to this day the dueling stone, inscribed H.H., on the spot where the affair took place. It has been reported that sounds of swords play have been heard in the vicinity of the dueling stone, which belongs to the National Trust. The ghost of Sir Henry is said to come back to Blickling on the anniversary of his death to revisit the southwest turret bedroom where he died the day before the duel. The present house was built between 1616 and 1624 by Sir Henry Hobart, Lord Chief Justice of England. And to do so, he pulled down the manor house that had stood on the site for at least two centuries. This is the house where Anne Boleyn, or Bullen, probably spent money, many happy months in her childhood and may have even have been born. When she became Queen of England and failed to bear Henry VIII a son, she was beheaded by a French swordsman on the block at the Tower of London. While imprisoned there, she is reputed to have written a number of poems. Some of the more poignant lines read, captive eye in this dread tower scenes of childhood recall they comfort bring in this dark hour now gaiety hath flown through blickling glades I fain would ride soft green sward sequestered shade no cruel intrigues to deride my simple rustic day 
A child. I watched the timid fawn, gentle-eyed, steal to the lake with thirst to quench when mists of dawn had from cool waters fled. Strutting peacocks, shimmering blue, roseate aber, arbor, scented walk, gladly I left, tis strangely true for pageantry at court. False vanities my pride hath tricked, this place of dank and anguished stone. By sullen river surges licked, doth mock my hopeless lot. Oh, were I still a child in stature small, to tread the rose-lined paths of Blickling Hall. Anne was executed on the 19th of May, 1536. And it is said that on the anniversary of her death, she drives at midnight in a coach through the lanes and over the long disused tracks of Norfolk, back to Blickling. Headless horses, drawing the coach which is driven by a headless coachman. Over the fields, down the main drive, the phantom coach reputedly races to disappear through the main entrance to the hall. Anne was not thirty when she died, and the figure in the coach is that of a young woman, but the slim body is headless, and she carries the bloody head on her lap. Christina Hole, a prominent member of the Folklore Society, writing in 1940, says, The occupants of the house are so used to her annual appearance that they take no notice of it. Some reports state that the coach itself, the horses drawing it, and the coachmen are dark, vague figures. But the form of Anne in a white dress is clearly visible. Bathed in a reddish light, the whole spectral appearance pursued by an eerie blue light. Some say the coach is driven by Sir Thomas Boleyn, Anne's father, cursed for a thousand years. For some unknown reason, to cross forty bridges in Norfolk to the anniversary of the night his daughter died. This legend seems to have become confused with that of the ghostly George Boleyn. Lord Rockford, Anne's brother, who, it is thought, spent his early years at Old Blickling Hall with Anne and her elder sister Mary, who later became one of Henry VIII's mistresses. Anne was arrested when she failed to bear the king a son and was charged with repeated adultery. Mark Smeaton, a young musician, admitted as much under torture. She was also charged with disturbing, distributing her favors among three of the king's intimate friends and finally of committing incest with her brother, who was executed at the same time as Anne. As news of the execution reached Blickling, four headless horses were seen careering across the countryside, dragging a headless man behind them his head secured under his arm. This is supposed to be the ghost of Lord Rockford, and the ghostly journey is allegedly repeated from time to time, the horses galloping across hedges and ditches, following by screaming devils, and finding no peace until they have crossed twelve bridges, which he must do before dawn. Another version has it that the phantom coach carrying Anne's headless body is hotly pursued by her ghostly brother, who has crossed twelve bridges and ditches in a belated attempt to avenge his sister's death. Anne's ghost has also been seen inside the hall and in the grounds about the same time of the year, according to the author of Highways and Byways in East Anglia. Many people have seen the ghost of Anne gliding through the corridors of the house. And the present custodian tells me that the likeness of Anne has been, walk has been seen walking in the gardens by the lake 
She has been described as being dressed in gray with a white mop cap. Sidney Hancock, the butler at Blickling in the late Lord Lothian's days, has been reported as declaring emphatically that this woman spoke to him. The actual conversation has never been made clear, but appears to have been something like this. Sidney Hancock. Excuse me, ma'am. Can I inquire if you're looking for someone? Anne Boleyn. That for which I search is lost forever. Mr. M. Dennis Mead, the custodian at Blickling, has collected quite a few stories, legends, and fantasies about the hall and its ghostly history over the years. In his early days at Blickling, there were some of the old servants still living nearby who had worked at the hall while it was still in private ownership, and these old folk, alas, all now dead, told many a tale of happenings in and around Blickling. They told Dennis Mead of the old cook's cat, which was lost in the attic rooms and could be heard mewing there for many years afterwards. Also of a fight between two men servants in the long cross attic room over a buxom servant girl. Both antagonists later died as an indirect result of their conflict. And it is said that the sounds of their struggles can still be heard in the cross attic room on nights of the full moon. A more recent and perhaps more convincing ghostly episode of Blickling Hall concerns some former tenants who had a high-spirited son who on his 21st birthday dressed himself in a suit of armor and clanked his way along a corridor to awaken his startled parents at dawn as dawn was breaking. The following year the son died in tragic circumstances. Some three years later, the occupants of the same area of the hall were awakened at dawn by heavy, ponderous footsteps, like those that would be made by a man in armor, walking along the corridor. The date was the anniversary of the young son's birthday. No explanation was ever found, and nobody has ever heard these sounds again. But the most persistent stories of ghosts of Blickling concern the ill-fated Anne. Perhaps the peace of Blickling attracts her tortured spirit, as one visitor expressed it. She may not have been born here, but her father certainly owned Blickling. It is likely that she knew the face, knew the place in happy childhood days, and remembered it with longing at the end of her life. Small wonder, then, that her spirit broods heavily over this mellow and beautiful house. Bodium Castle, East Sussex. Interesting and romantic, sitting like a bird on the waters of her moat. Bodium looks every inch a castle, and indeed the walls and towers remain almost intact. But within the two meters thick walls, it is largely a ruin. A curtain-walled castle, built in 1386. It has been described as one of the best examples of medieval military architecture. A few years before Bodium Castle was built, the French had sacked Rye and Winches, Win Chelsea, and with, and with the river Rother navigable up to Bodium, Sir Edward Dallengridge was given royal license to fortify his manor house in defense of the adjacent countryside and for resistance against our enemies. Having amassed considerable wealth abroad and weary of exile, the knight returned to England and established himself at his wife's native place of Bodium. 
Over the succeeding years, Bodium Castle changed hands many times, and local tradition has it that it stood siege more than once. But on this point, history is silent. It is referred to in accounts of the Wars of the Roses, and it was lived in during the 15th and 16th centuries, and probably suffered internal damage during the Civil War. The present custodian has been there for 55 years. Both he and his father, before him, say they have never heard of a ghost, but back in the 1920s, Harry Price, the noted psychic researcher and investigator, gave a lecture at the Ghost Club, of which he was then chairman, on the subject of Haunted Sussex, and he included Bodium. Of Bodium Castle, he said he had traced stories of the sound of revelry at night. At certain times during the winter months, the sound emanating quite distinctly from within the shell of the castle. He went on. The clinking of drinking cups, songs in a foreign tongue, intermixed with strange oaths, have been heard over and over again by people passing the ruins late at night. Another feature of this haunt is the music, faint but distinct, which it is stated can always be heard on Easter Sunday by those whose ears are attuned to psychic music. The foreign sounding songs and expressions might be accounted for by the fact that Sir Edward Dallengridge and his men must have acquired a considerable knowledge of French during their adventures across the Channel. He had accompanied, he had campaigned in Normandy and Brittany and was regarded as the hero of Creasy and Poitiers, and perhaps some of his henchmen were French. Edward B. Dauvern, in his exploration of English castles, suggests that Bodium Castle may have had bitter memories for its owner, and perhaps it has been the scene of former joys too sweet to be recalled. It is not impossible that something of the tragic and romantic happenings of what once took place here have impinged themselves on the atmosphere of this beautiful place. Some hauntings, and in particular ghostly sounds, have been found to diminish over the years, almost like a battery running down. And perhaps those supernormal sounds, once so frequently and regularly heard in Bodium, have now become quiescent. Sir Edward Dallengridge won his spurs fighting under the Black Prince, and later, and with more profit, under the famous land pirate, Sir Robert Nullis. Bramber Castle. Staining West Sussex. All that remains of the once proud Norman castle surrounded by a deep moat are a few meager stones where the pathetic ghosts of three starved children have been seen, usually in the month of December. The castle ruins are situated on the northeast side of Bramber Street, and the Saxon word of Brimber, a fortified place, gave the place its name. At the time of Doomsday Book, a general survey ordered by William the Conqueror, there is reference to the baronial castle of the honor of Brimber of Brimber, and it was then held by William de Browse who subsequently died during a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. He was succeeded by his son, another William. He was likewise succeeded by a son named William, who is said to have treacherously murdered many important people when he was invited to a feast at his castle at Abergavenny, including Sitsilt ap Dimswald. 
He then proceeded to Sitsilt's dwelling, slew his surviving son in his mother's presence, and set fire to the house. Later, appalled at his atrocious conduct, he built the church at New Shoreham and conferred large endowments on churches in Normandy and Abergavenny by way of restitution. This William de Browse had five children, three boys and two girls. Reginald the heir, some years older than the rest, lived in a castle in Ireland. The rest of the family lived amid much pomp and grandeur at Bramber. In due course, the wealth and popularity of the Lord of Bramber excited the jealous hatred of King John, who only wanted for an opportunity to effect the ruin of de Browse. The Lord of Bramber was one of the Confederate barons who had taken an active part in the endeavor to obtain a redress of public grievances and a better administration of the laws, and King John was determined to make an example of him. He could have seized de Browse in, in person, but he knew that the man's great popularity would have resulted in all Sussex taking arms, so he devised another scheme. He sent his equerry, Sir Peter Maulieu, who had assisted in the murder of Prince Arthur, to Bramber to demand de Browse's children as hostages for his good behavior in the future. When de Browse sternly refused such a barbarous suggestion, King John swore he would be revenged and ordered an army to march against Bramber Castle. The castle was not prepared for a siege, and de Browse, powerful baron that he was, knew he had no hope of maintaining a war with the King of England, so he decided, for the safety of his lady and their children, to abandon Bramber and flee to his son in Ireland, which he did. The King, however, obtained word of what was happening, and no sooner had de Browse and his family landed in Ireland than they were seized and brought back to England and taken to Windsor Castle, where King John then was. Jubilant at the success of his plan, King John saw at last the opportunity of presenting an example to all rebellious barons, and he commanded that the whole family should be imprisoned in one of the towers of Windsor, and there starved to death. Another version of the story, King John's own in fact, tells of an agreement that was broken by de Browse, who escaped to France and that only Lady de Browse and her four children were starved to death. The later history of Bramber Castle includes the story of a wronged husband, Sir Hubert de Hurst, and his unfaithful wife, Lady Maud, and of her dying in strange circumstances after the murder of her lover, William de Lindfield. In 1954, some of the residents of Bramber reported hearing the sound of a woman wailing among the ruins of the castle. One resident described the cry as containing four notes. The belief at that time was that the noises were attributable to the ghost of the beautiful Lady Maud, sorrowing for her lover, who was said to have been trapped and walled up alive by her madly jealous and older husband towards the end of the 15th century. The Lady Maud is said to have discovered her husband's grim revenge on the end, on the night that he surreptitiously laid the course of bricks that sealed the fate of the unfortunate of the unfortunate de Linfield. Next day, Lady Maud herself was found dead. Years later, when the castle was attacked by parliamentarian troops, a skeleton was discovered crouched in the corner, the head resting on the hands, the elbows on the knees. The mortal remains of William de Lingfield. And there are other stories of intrigue and murder at Bramber. 
but the most persistent ghosts are said to be those of the three younger children of William de Burrell's two daughters, Blanche and Jane, and the youngest of all, the little Hugh. It is now 800 years since the castle was built here on a natural mound above the river Adur. It is long centuries ago when William de Brows, that wealthy and powerful baron who owned 40 manors, lived here in discord with his king, but popular with his neighbors. But it is believed to be the ghosts of his children, a boy and two girls, who now appear as ragged ghosts, holding out their emaciated hands as though begging for food. Perhaps the most pathetic ghosts in all Britain. Bramshill House, near Hartley Whitney, Hampshire. The present historic and majestic Jacobian mansion is built on the side of much earlier buildings. Bromsell is twice mentioned in Doomsday Book, and references to the house can be traced back to the days of Edward the Confessor. Today, an ancient gateway and part of the cellars remain of a 14th century building. Several ghosts from different periods have been seen here in various parts of the house that is now used as a police training college. I learned when I visited Bramshill, first and foremost, there is the famous legend of the mistletoe bough. This concerns a young bride. At her wedding celebrations, or at a Christmas party, hiding inside a carved chest with a hidden spring that could only be operated from outside the chest. And the poor little girl, the poor, <sighs> the poor girl suffocating. And the body only being discovered long after she had expired. A moldering corpse dressed in white and clutching a sprig of mistletoe. The ghostly form of a girl in white carrying a sprig of mistletoe has reportedly been seen many times in different parts of Bramshill. But most frequently, in what are now administrative rooms, especially the Fleur de Lis room, where other odd happenings have been experienced. The Romanian royal family, king, queen, and two children stayed at Bramshill after the Second World War, when the house was in private ownership, and they and their staff reported seeing the ghost of a beautiful girl in a white, old-fashioned dress. In fact, the queen twice asked for her children to sleep in a different room because they were disturbed by a woman in white who ran through their room. Later, an exorcism was performed here at the request of King Michael. He was worried by his children asking when the white lady was going to return to play with them. Other witnesses for the mysterious white lady include police officers and their wives a Red Cross worker, two builders, civilian staff, and visitors. Secondly, excuse me. Secondly, there is the Grey Lady, probably a ghost of the Cope family, who owned Bramshill for more than two centuries. This form sometimes accompanied, accompanied by the inexplicable aroma of lilies of the valley, has most often been seen in the early hours of the morning, disappearing through walls or passing through closed doors. A sad-looking ghost with golden hair and dressed in a straight, sleeveless gray robe. In 1962, the gray lady was seen by a Ministry of Works engineer who had been employed at Bramshill for many years and previously been skeptical of ghost stories. He described the figure as that of a beautiful young lady with auburn hair who walked sadly through the long gallery 
and disappeared. The unexplained perfume of lilies of the valley, strong and unmistakable, convinced skeptical Colin Atkinson, the college engineer for the previous five years, when he encountered the scent in the summer of 1980. This report is based on that in, the, in an official police paper dated May 1981. He and his wife were in the company of the assistant staff officer's wife in the terrace drawing room adjoining the college bar. It was one of the Bramshaw guest nights. At this time, the girls in the accounts office by the long gallery had been reporting the strong smell of lilies of the valley which they were totally unable to explain. The girls suspected a practical joker and searched each other's handbags, but without solving the mystery, Colin Atkinson takes up the story. It was about 9 p.m. The three of us had just had dinner and the women went up to the long gallery on a ghost hunt, if you like, while I got some drinks ready. When they came back to the room, they stepped back quickly. As I went over to them, I walked right into an area which I, which held a strong smell of lilies of the valley. The area was about six by three feet, and you could step in and out of the smell. There was nothing frightening about it, but I thought afterwards that it was about the size of a grave or a chest. It lasted three or four minutes. Being a skeptic, I was so impressed that I spoke to a college parson. He pointed out the floor had been taken up to the nursery, had taken up in the nursery, and wondered what might have been disturbed. But it took more than that to turn Colin Atkinson into a believer. His twelve years in the Royal Navy and a similar period in the prison service had produced a hard-headed skeptic. After spending some time with the Crays and the Richardson, you don't believe things that you don't see. And I'm not the skeptic now that I used to be, he says. Sudden drops in temperature have sometimes accompanied appearances of the Grey Lady. And this curious phenomenon has often been reported in the Long Gallery, now used as part of the library. One employee of Bramshill was making his rounds of the house one autumn evening accompanied by his Labrador dog when he suddenly found himself face to face with the gray lady and at the same time the room felt icy cold. If I was mistaken, he said afterwards, the dog wasn't. She gave a howl of terror and fell over backwards. Then she ran home as fast as she could and I wasn't far behind her. Then, then, there is the, glow, the ghostly gray man. I, pardon me. There is the ghostly green man. Always seen in the vicinity of water. Sometimes standing on the little bridge near the Tudor gatehouse and sometimes beside one of the lakes in the park. Oddly enough, an eccentric cope ancestor, always dressed in green and drowned himself in 1806. Some witnesses have said the green man appears to be legless, and it is a curious fact that the cope ancestor obtained for himself a green suit, hat, gloves, just about everything, but he could not obtain green Wellington boots which were not manufactured at that time. One wonders whether at a distance black Wellington boots melt into the background and are not seen. Other ghostly sightings outside the house have included at least one appearance of the white lady, a man arriving at the house in a car to collect his wife after a dance, saw a white lady seemingly step into, the, into one of the bridge recesses. It was past midnight, and he stopped to give the girl a lift. But she had unaccountably disappeared. On another occasion, reported in an official police newspaper in, in 1979, a woman in a long dress was seen walking on the grass. 
a motorist pulled up and called to her, but she ignored him, turned towards the mansion and drifted through the wall surrounding the front of the house and disappeared. In 1976, a security officer on night patrol encountered yet another Bramshill ghost, believed to be Ronald, the son of Bramshill's last private owner, Lord Brockett. Ronald died in tragic circumstances some oh, 30 years previously. The security man distinctly saw the figure of a young man in tennis gear carrying a racket. Thinking it must be a student who had wandered out of bounds, the security man approached the figure. Before he could reach it, the form turned and seemed to look at him and then strode towards the fireplace and disappeared through the wall. There is also a haunted path in the grounds of Bramshill. It is on the northwest side of the lake path which, where it is overgrown, forms a long tunnel of intertwining branches. Here the college engineer and others have discovered that their dog sent something invisible to themselves. Colin Atkinson again. I've had two dogs while I've been at Bramshill, and along with other animals, they have both refused to go through that tunnel. The first was a little Manchester Terrier. And when I took her through, she stopped, a coward, and then suddenly shot through. She would never go near the place after that. At the moment, he said in 1981, I have a border collie, and he doesn't want to know either. He always goes round that spot, even though it means going down a banking and up the other side. The paddled hall with its stone screen and carved bride's chest is haunted by the ghost of an old man with a long beard. The chapel drawing room by a woman from the days of Queen Anne. An adjoining room has a ghost lady dressed in the tight bodice and full skirt of the days of Charles I. And an upstairs bedroom is haunted by an invisible ghostly presence. A child's tiny hand is sometimes placed into the hand of a visitor. Another room on the first floor is occasionally peopled by ghostly forms that seem to float two feet or so above the existing floor. And it is an interesting fact that this particular floor was lowered during structural alterations. But the ghosts, it would seem, walk where they have always walked. In 1972, a college security officer was in the hall when he saw a man on the path outside walking towards the house. A man dressed in a gray flannel suit. Later, Mr. William Chalk reported what he had seen. The man came through, in through the open door, closed crossed the hall and went straight through the wall opposite. The back of my neck went cold and I hurried round the corner to see where he had gone, but he had never reappeared. Later I found that where he had walked through the wall there used to be an archway, but the arch had been bricked up years ago. As recently as 1980, according to Patrol, the official newspaper of the Sussex Police, a figure was seen to appear and vanish in the college reception hall. The chapel and the drawing room are situated directly above the reception hall, and it is from here that security men on night patrol have heard footsteps. Footsteps that have no rational explanation. So often have these sounds been heard and investigated with negative results that nowadays the strange sounds are accepted as part of the routine of night patrol at Bramshill, and they are no longer even investigated. The terrace, with its loggias, balustrading, elegant bay windows, 
is haunted by a mysterious woman in white. She appeared dramatically one evening in front of Sir William Cope and members of his family. Everyone present saw a white-robed figure leaning over the balustrade at the far end of the terrace, thinking that one of the housemaids must be sleepwalking. Sir William sent for the butler, and as he approached the figure, it suddenly seemed to melt into the balustrade. After it had disappeared, evidence came to light that a similar figure had been seen on the terrace previously, and it invariably disappeared when someone approached it. There are rooms at Brownshill where no dog will enter, and parts of the grounds where animals show signs of fright. And there are other stories of strange happenings throughout the house and grounds, not without cause, as Bramshaw called the most haunted house in Hampshire. Brodick Castle, Isle of Erin. Strathclyde. The delights of Brodick Castle on the Isle of Arran are many and varied, says Peter Ryan in the first comprehensive guide to National Trust properties. It has a beautiful setting between the bay and the hills in an incomparable garden. Its principal rooms contain a wealth of fine furniture, paintings, china, and porcelain. And it has a long, eventful history. He does not mention the perambulations of Brodick's mysterious gray lady. Hmm. The Vikings had a fortress where this red sandstone castle now stands. They yielded it to the McDonald's, Lords of the Isles. Robert the Bruce was here in 1306 when he claimed the castle as a royal property. But frequent interdynastic quarrels in succeeding centuries caused Brodick to change hands many times. Eventually, James III gave the property to his nephew, James Hamilton, in 1502. And it was held by that property to his nephew, sorry. It was held by that family until the Duchess of Montrose, daughter of the 12th Duke of Hamilton, bequested it to the National Trust for Scotland on her death in 1958. Today, the Scottish baronial mansion seems to watch over Brodick Bay, and there is a rarefied and distinct feeling noticed by many visitors of former generations of occupants being present. The property controller, John M. Forgie, tells me that the Grey Lady is supposed to be one of three victims of the plague of 1700 when three ladies who were thought to have the plague were immured within the massive walls of the oldest part of the castle. One is supposed to walk the corridors from time to time, although neither myself, my wife, nor our family, who have been in residence of the castle for some ten years, have yet seen the apparition. I did hear that the lady Jean Ford's son was said to have seen the ghost when he was a child. When I spoke to Lady Jean, she told me the following publication of her fascinating Castle in the Air in 1982. She planned a second volume which she would deal in detail with a Brodick ghost. In the meantime, she has been kind enough to give me some details, and it seems that there has always been a story of a gray lady ghost at the castle. When a somewhat psychic housekeeper, Mrs. Muncie, was there, the form appeared several times. 
She was seen from different viewpoints and was usually described as looking like a dairy maid. She was most often seen going down a black a back stairway, dressed in a gray dressed in gay <sighs> bloody hell, dressed in gray with a white collar. Sometimes the form was followed into the servants' hall, where she always disappeared. One morning, the butler noticed the figure walk down the stairway and pause beside an odd job man who was scrubbing the flooring of the passage, and she seemed to speak with him before passing on. When the girl had disappeared in puzzling circumstances, the butler asked the odd job man who the girl was who had spoken to him, whereupon the surprised man denied all knowledge of seeing or speaking to any girl while he had been scrubbing the floor that morning. The housekeeper saw the same figure several times, and since she professed to have the gift of being able to produce automatic writing, she was badgered by other members of staff and some of the family to try and find out what she could about the gray lady. The story she unfolded by this somewhat dubious means revealed that the girl was a serving wench at the castle at the time that Cromwellian troops were billeted there. The general in command had had an affair with her, and she was pregnant. In those days, such girls were simply thrown out of the place where they were employed, and this poor girl is supposed to have gone out of the castle and committed suicide by the old quay below the castle. I also learned of a completely different ghost here, a man in a long green jacket and breeches and wearing a wig. He has been seen on occasions in the library, usually seated in a chair beside the fireplace. But who he is and why he appears is not known. Lady Jean Ford, daughter of Mary, Duchess of Montrose, tells me there is a long-standing tradition that a ghostly white deer always appears when the head of the ancient family of Hamilton dies. Such an animal, she tells me, was certainly seen at Brodick after the death of two successive heads of the family within living memory. Forays, Morayshire, Grampian. This castle has been the seat of an ancient family of Brody since the 11th century, but little is known of the early history of the Brodies, for practically all the family papers and documents were destroyed when Lord Lewis Gordon set fire to the property during the Montrose Campaign of 1645. The castle was rebuilt and today contains many valuable paintings. Some fine French furniture, English, continental, and Chinese porcelain, and a room where a former Brody manifested after death. Hugh, the 23rd chief and grandfather of the present Brody of Brody, died in Switzerland in September 1889 having been treated for neuralgic pains of the heart at Isle Bain. When he had left Brody Castle some two months earlier, the whole castle had been let, the only time in his long history that this had happened, with the exception of the Laird's ground floor study or business room, which was kept locked and shuttered. During the evening of the 20th of September, 1889, the butler startled the tenants by going up to the drawing room and announcing, There is someone and a master's study. The family and residents hurried down, and sure enough, although the door of the room was securely locked and no lights were visible, distinct noises emanated from the room as of someone moving objects about inside the room, accompanied by the sounds of papers being shuffled. And they heard, too, a strange and frightening moaning sound. Eventually, all was silent. 
Next day, the first news reached the castle of the death of Brody of Brody. An event which had taken place the previous afternoon. No explanation was ever found for the mysterious sounds heard by the butler and the occupants and other servants. In answer to my inquiries, the present Brody of Brody tells me, This, I'm afraid, is the only ghost I can offer you. And that was a one-night stand. That has never been heard again. Curiosities at Brody Castle include the bones of a young child preserved in a glass-fronted cabinet in the charter room, a small and windowless area where all the available family documents are kept. In the 18th century, a spiral staircase was removed from a corner turret in one of the towers and the skeleton of a young child was unearthed. The origin of these bones has never been established, and there is no legend or story to account for them. A far more valuable find occurred in 1970, when Mrs. Helena Brody of Brody discovered by accident some books in the old stables. One of them proved to be a previously unrecorded 10th century English religious manuscript, a working pontifical, a book which only a bishop would have used. No one knows why such a valuable property came to be among the dust and rubbish of the stables or how it managed to remain there for so long before being discovered. It is now preserved in the British Museum. Buckland Abbey near Tavistock, Devonshire. Reputedly completed from start to finish in three days by preternatural means, this house that was once a monastery and became the home of Sir Francis Drake after his circumnavigation of the world is said to harbor the sound of plain song chanting strange, dark, unidentified, and muttering figures, and even the occasional appearance of Drake himself taking his wild ride back to earth, driving a hearse drawn by headless horses. Drake's famous drum, the oldest English drum extant, was restored to the Abbey in 1968 after spending four years in the vault of a London bank. It is supposed to be the one Drake took around the world with him aboard the Pelican, and it was probably beaten when he was buried at sea in 1596. As he lay dying in Nombre de Dios Bay, he is said to have declared that if ever England was in danger, the drum would sound by itself and he would return. Well authenticated stories tell how the drum was heard beating by itself before the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. In 1939 before the Second World War and at various other times, not always when England was clearly in danger but that it has been heard sounding by itself by many people seems indisputable. Reports of unexplained chanting and the occasional appearance of inexplicable dark and muttering figures here and fragmentary, comparatively rare, but I have spoken to people who swear they have seen and heard the fearsome side of Devon's famous ghost. Drake driving a black hearse, pulled by headless horses and accompanied by headless hounds, whose baying causes or foretells the death of any earthly dog that hears it. Burnmore Tarn, Eskdale, Cumbria. The wide expanses of Burnmore Tarn, 
beside the path leading from Eskdale to Walsdale, have long been the haunt of a phantom animal, a coffin-bearing fell pony that used to carry the bodies of cragsmen, dalesmen, and their families across the enormous moor. One story tells of the body of a young dalesman being taken to its last resting place one autumn afternoon when the pony, for some unexplained reason, took fright and bolted. In no time, it had disappeared into the wintry gloom. With the coffin securely strapped to its back, and a straggle of mourners were left to make their sad way to the young man's home, and there to inform his old and infirm mother what had happened. The news, so goes the story, was too much of a shock for her, and she had a heart attack, and within a day or two she was dead. So a few days later, another funeral cortege was making its way across Bournemore Tarn, and this time it was the old woman's coffin that was being borne by one of the fell ponies. As they reached the spot where the other pony had bolted, this animal too suddenly reared and for no apparent reason bolted off over the moor, carrying the old woman's remains in the coffin on his back. Some of the mourners attempted to give chase, but the terrified animal galloped off at full speed and was soon lost in the freezing fog. A few of the more hardy followers pressed on, however, and soon they came across the coffin of the sun lost some days previously. With some difficulty, they carried it to the churchyard and completed the funeral, but of the second pony and the coffin of the old woman, it is said that never a trace was found, although many have seen, many have been the stories of people glimpsing the form of a horse with a dark box-like shape on its back, a form that suddenly appears out of the mist of swirling fog, and then it suddenly disappears with never a sound accompanying the apparition.